Good morning, and again, welcome to the Minutes That Matter broadcast. We're going to be looking at, and I love to talk about the men, because I believe you can get the men straight. If we can get our men in the homes together, I believe we can keep our families uh, together. But so many times um, you have to uh, come to an understanding that uh, the, the man is the key component uh, in the family. And how many times can a man hear wake up calls without waking up? There, there are so many men who, who asleep at the wheel and they need to wake up. Uh, I ask how many times can a man hear a wake up call without waking up? Uh, some men, I suppose, never wake up. You know, because it's so easy to snooze through life or what the Bible calls in Hebrews chapter two and verse number one, a drifting away. Or the Bible said in 1 Timothy 5, verse number 6, being dead, you know, while she lives. Uh, or a person could be held captive by the devil. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26. Or they could be living in darkness. Acts 26 and verse number 20. Or simply just being lost. Luke 19 and verse number 10. Even Christians, children of God. Uh, are admonished to awaken from their sleep for now is their salvation nearer than when they first believed Romans chapter 13 and the verse is number 11. And then also we find in first Thessalonians five and verse number six, the Bible says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Uh, these are just a sample of the wake up calls for men um, today and there are other things that uh, men need to be uh, mindful of. And I'll just give you a, a list of things we need to wake up to when your children are out of control. Um, my friend, I want you to know that 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 will serve as a wake up call. And then not only that, but when when your wife is distant or your family doesn't respect you. That's a wake up call. You know, you, you got to be mindful. You, you got to be mindful of these. And then you say, I don't have a close relationship with anybody. That, that ought to be a wake-up call uh, to you. And so many times these wake-up calls come. Many times we just fail, uh, my friend, to wake up. And so, therefore, you know, we find ourselves in our homes, um, you know, just going completely astray. Another um uh, wake up call is you said, well, when you hear your Christian, your Christian father, he said, I can't properly explain basic biblical truths to others or find the verses that support such teachings that you need a wake up call. You say, I don't have a close relationship with my children, man. You need a wake up call. You say, I'm starting to make the same arguments that non Christians are making. You need a wake up call. You say, well, I'll come to conclusion that one doesn't have to obey the commands of God in order to be saved. You need a wake-up call because Hebrews 5, 9 is plain. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. You need a wake-up call. You say, I don't have a clue what is going on in the lives of my children. You need a wake-up call. You say, well, I'm not presently trying to convert anybody I'm into the Lord's church. You need a wake-up call. You say, I haven't prayed for a week. You need a wake-up call. I'm involved in a sinful activity or a sinful habit. You need a wake-up call. I'm trying to find happiness, purpose, and meaning for my life in something other than my relationship with God and serving him. You need a wake-up call. The Bible still says the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14, is to, is to fear God and keep his commandments. And then say, so I have a, a negative attitude toward the church and other Christians. My friends, you need, you need a wake-up call. And you need a wake-up call because we need men in the home today who have vision. Let's start there. Men who need to have a vision. And one man compared the role of a husband and father to a scout on a wagon train. He says they ought to be looking ahead, giving direction, anticipating needs, and defining the destination. And that's what it's all about. You got to look ahead, give direction, anticipate needs and define the destination what makes a man what makes a man what makes a man a good leader well first and foremost and above all else it is vision a vision for something larger than himself as men we often misplace our vision we focus 
uh, myopically on ca- houses and cars and stocks and bank accounts and piling up junk. Premature junk is all we do. We imagine status and security in these things when, in fact, there is no status or security if you don't have relationships. Too many guys squander their vision and they wonder why they lose their families. It is the all too common downside to superficial definitions of success. And don't let anyone uh, fool you. Nothing makes up for the failure of a family. It was Solomon, uh, the, the writer of Proverbs. He had a vision and he, he described in detail the types of situations uh, that his son would encounter uh, in life. Uh, look with me quickly um, in Proverbs 1 in verse uh, 10. He, he was a man of vision. Verse 10, he said, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole. And those that go down into the pit, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And then he, he warns them. He constantly warns them. If you back up to verse 5, he says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. He constantly uh, reminded, given vision. Proverbs 6, verse 1 through 5. My son, if thou be surety of thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art coming to the hand of thy friend. Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and a bird from the hand of the fowler. Constantly he would give um, he would give advice. And then don't have time when you, um, in, in Proverbs 6, and beginning of verse uh, 24, all the way through chapter 7 of Proverbs, Verse 27, he just constantly just gives advice, constantly um, give advice. And um, you have to be a, a man of vision. You know, a, a provisionary looks uh, down the years and down the road and down through the years and asks himself questions uh, such as if our marriage were, were to go on just the way it's going, what will it be like for us in five years, ten years? or even 20 years. I'm talking about a man of vision. We need more men in the home who are men who are visionaries, men who can look past the the present and look at where they're they're leading their family in the future. Uh, We need to have men uh, of vision, men uh, who can look ahead, give direction, anticipate need, and define the destination. Um, These are men who, who, who are at the point where they can they have a vision where the family is going, but then they can envision the vision. How are we going to get from where we are to where we need to be? You need a visionary um, to do that. And a visionary looks down the road and he asks himself uh, the question. First of all, if our marriage were to go on just the way it's been going, what will our marriage be like in five years, 10 years or 20 years? And then uh, number Uh, Two, how can I build the self-esteem of my wife who spends, you know, large amounts of time doing house chores and taking care of the children? What how can I build the self-esteem of my wife? Visionary. How can I help my help my children understand and control the emotions, especially little girls before their hormones start jumping through their bodies and, and the young boys? How can I? help these young men to understand themselves and the changes in their bodies uh, before they reach that point where their hormones kick in. Visionary. Uh, When do I need to first talk to my children about sex? Visionary. What kind of things might my children encounter uh, once they uh, leave 
uh, preschool and going to elementary school and middle school and high school? How can I prepare them visionary? How can I manage my career goals uh, so that I'm available uh, to my children visionary? What will my children need uh, in their father once uh, they get to the point they go off to college and begin to build a life of their own visionary? What kind of a husband will my wife need when she uh, she gets older in life and have to go through menopause and the different phases of her life? How can I help her get through uh, this passage of life visionary? What kind of traits will my children, my grandchildren cherish, you know, about me in regards to the kind of father and grandfather I will eventually become visionary? What type of maturity, maturity is, going to, is going to take to grow old and yet not to grow bitter? A visionary. What stands between me and being, being a leader in the Lord's church? A visionary. What will this church look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years if I don't try to share the gospel with those who are lost in my neighborhood, in my community, and on my job? Visionary. We need men who are, first of all, who are visionaries. Men who can look beyond themselves. And you have to get to that. You have to get to that. Get, get to that point. You have to get to that. That, that point of, of understanding uh, that you want to be a man who can lead a family, but but one who's looking looking down the road. You you have to be able to look down the road and, and see beyond today, and, and just see just where just where your family's um, is going. A man must be a visionary, but then. Um, the man must be the head. The, the man must be the head. Both men and women are given the command to subdue the earth and rule over the entire physical creation. Uh, we read that in Genesis 1 in verse number 28. Uh, the male is the one who is given the primary responsibility to rule. A man rules and leads his family. Uh, Genesis uh, 18, and, and I'm going to read that. Genesis 18 in verse number 19. The, the Bible uh, says, for I know that he will command his children, his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. He, he looked for the man uh, to lead his family. Husbands are the head of the wife, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, just like Christ, the head of the church. It is the male responsibility, the male Christian who preaches to both genders, First Timothy 2 verse 12. And he is to um, the preacher man, um, helping us to understand that. And I'm saying this because we're living in a, in a time where women are trying to assume the role of the man. God never told a woman to preach, never told a woman to preach. And they are preaching today, but they're not by God's authority. Nowhere you'll find God ever commanded a woman to preach. A, a woman is not to preach. And, and, and 1 Timothy 2 verse number 12, she cannot usurp authority over the man. A woman cannot usurp authority over the man. Now, when a man preaches, Titus 2.15, he is to preach with all authority. And the reason a woman can't preach, she doesn't have all authority. You got to have all authority to preach. But a woman does not have all authority because she cannot usurp authority over the man. So why is she preaching? She has no business. And this is, this is a lack of of men fulfilling their role, their God-given role. And whenever you find weak men, women will take over. Women preachers are nothing but a woman who's taken over. She's in a role, just like Eve tried to do, to take over the role of leadership. And it's the same way, just like God had to punish Eve, that woman is going to be punished as well. And all those who are following this false teacher, this false preacher, they're going to suffer the same fate. No woman, let me just say that clear, no woman has any business preaching today. There is no scripture, and I stand flat-footed and firm. You can contact me. I will deal with it. Have no problem with this issue at all. No woman. Jesus had 12, 12 apostles, and I've heard all kind of ridiculous arguments. People talking about, well, you know, Mary was pregnant with Jesus, therefore she carried the word. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, then I heard in regards to when Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he had told a woman to go tell uh, the disciples to meet me in Galilee. Yeah, he sent her with a message. But guess what? Once the message got to them, her job was over. Men, men have a continual job, a continual job. That's why you read that Philip, the Bible said in the book of Acts, that Philip had daughters that prophesied, have daughters that prophesied. But when you read Acts chapter 8, 
out there. There was a man, Ethiopian eunuch. God needed somebody to preach to him. You notice he didn't call one of Philip's daughters. He called Philip to go talk to that man. A woman has never, has never received authority from the Lord to preach. And I'm waiting for your scripture, waiting for your scripture. And I, don't come with all this, you know, all this, this, you know, we got so many way out the way things we try to prove. But my friend, one thing about it, the Bible is right. Jesus had 12 apostles. When Judas messed up, they had to select another one. And guess what? There were two men under consideration, not a woman at all. And so therefore, a woman is out of her place when she tries to preach. It's the man, the male in the congregation, um, the elders who are men who shepherd the flock, ten feeding, guiding, protecting the flock from wolves. First Timothy chapter three, verse one and two. First Peter chapter five, verse one through three. And so, and therefore, these are, my friend, the responsibility of, 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 of headship. Now we have headship in the home. And then as a man serves in the home, when he does a good job at home, he also is afforded the privilege of being a leader in the body of Christ. Because a man, if he don't know how to take care of his own house, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel uh, if you don't take care of his own. And so therefore, you got to take care of home first. Your home life has to be right first. The man, he must take care of his own household. And, and, and when he takes care of his household, then he has, he's been afforded the privilege of taking care of the Lord's, of the Lord's house. And leading, just like he shows direction uh, to um, his his house, um, you have to understand that the um, the responsibility of the man is is laden upon him to take care of his home, be good at home, uh, that he might be able to be good, uh, be good to the church. He has to be a visionary at home, and, and therefore he can be a visionary uh, in the Lord's in the Lord's church. Um, uh, you have to understand that being a man in the home is, is, is you're a man under orders. You know, uh, being a man is that you, you are under orders. Uh, why do I teach my children? Why do I set guidelines? Why do I tell them no? Or why do I watch over the spiritual welfare of my family, my wife, my children? Uh, why do I do that? Because as men, we are under orders. As men, we need to catch the vision that, uh, that Paul had, and that is a receiving a tremendous commission from God. And regardless of the cost, he was intent upon fulfilling his mission. Listen to Paul in Acts chapter 20. And I love this. Acts chapter 20. And look at verse number 20. Paul was under orders. Paul says, and how I kept back nothing. As he calls for those Ephesian elders. Paul says, how I kept back nothing. That was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, and now I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. So I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was under orders. When men marry, they're accepting a mission. When men have children, they, they accept another mission. When men obey the gospel, they accept yet and still another mission. One of the Hebrew uh, terms uh, rendered man in the Old Testament is ish, I-S-H. And it may have the fundamental concept of strong or one who is a piercer. At the core, at his core, a man is an initiator. A man must be an initiator. One who moves forward. That's a man. One who moves forward. He advances toward the horizon. One who leads. That's a man. One who initiates. Uh, he moves forward. He advances toward the horizon. He leads. And at the core of his masculinity is initiation. It is the provision of direction. It is security, stability, and it is connection. Sadly, some men lack this initiative, especially in the realm of providing spiritual, moral, emotional, and financial leadership for their families. A man without initiative is like, is like a compass without a needle or a boat without a rudder. 
A lot of people pass through life feeling trapped in some vague sense of dissatisfaction because they really don't know what they're doing. They, they, they have no concept of this initiative, this uh, no concept, uh, my friend, of this uh, this provision of direction, this uh, this um, uh, this wave of security, stability, and connection that they provide. They have no sense at all as to what they're supposed to be doing. That's why they're not good. They're not heads. They're not well, who God want them to be. So they got to be the head. Number two, they got to be the warrior. They must be warriors. A warrior is a protector. Whether he's stepping, um, you know, stepping on someone's toes to stand for what's right, or whether he gets up, checks on uh, the sounds that, that go bump in the night, whether he's confronting um, um, a teacher um, who uh, may have crossed the line with his daughter, or, or whether uh, he is uh, shining a bright light uh, in, in a dark basement. He's a warrior, whether he is out there cutting the grass or, or he's helping uh, his children, uh, uh, my friend, doing homework or an assignment, whatever the case is, he's a warrior. A warrior is somebody who possess high moral standards and holds on to high principles. A warrior is one who's living, willing to live by and stand by his principles. He's able to spend uh, even himself for those principles. And if necessary, he would die for those principles. He's a warrior. He would die for his family. He's not aloof. He's a warrior. He's a warrior. Many times and many people, the warrior in them is out of sync. And we need to understand that we are called upon to be warriors. We must be individuals who take a stand in this world today. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 3, Paul said, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He's telling Timothy, be a warrior. First Timothy chapter four, verse six and seven. The Bible said, but if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of truth and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fable and excise thyself rather unto godliness. He's saying to Timothy, be a warrior. First Timothy five, verse 19, he says against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, that them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge thee before God, the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without prefer preferring one before another doing nothing by partiality. He's telling him, be a warrior. Chapter 6 and verse number 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast pro professed a good profession before many, many witnesses. He's telling him, you got to fight the good fight of faith. But then 2 Timothy 1, 7, he said, but God has not given us a spirit of fear but a power and a love, discipline, sound mind. He tells us that we have an awesome responsibility. Second Timothy chapter two, verses three and verse number nine. He says, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse nine, he says, wherein I suffer trouble, even as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. He said, you have to learn to be, be a warrior. Titus 1 verse number 9. Hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. That he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We have to be warriors. We have to be men who take a stand. There are so many. It's so sad that so many do not take a stand. So many who will not stand when they should be standing. The time is now for us to stand, to take a stand. And be what God has called us, called us to be. My friend, this is what uh, you and I have been called to do. This is what God is looking for us to do. Let us be warriors. Let us be what God has called us uh, to be. And it's more than just uh, saying you're a man. Uh, it's all about a man who's under orders. Being the head that God intended. You're the head, but also, not only you're the head, but you got to realize 
that you must be a warrior. You're a warrior. I want to submit to you that a man is a teacher, that a man must be a teacher. A man is supposed to know things. He's supposed to know certain things. Uh, he, he, he should know um, uh, many things. He, he ought to know. A man ought to be a man of knowledge. He ought to make sure that, that he is knowledgeable uh, so that people in your family can come to you and ask you for questions and get the correct answer. A man ought to know. There's certain things he ought to know. He may not know completely how a car runs, but he ought to know a little something about, about cars. He ought to know a little something how to fix things around, around the house. He ought to, he ought to know um, little things, you know, and, and, and he need to uh, know stuff, um, you know, uh, and, 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 so, and so therefore, you know, a man's supposed to know uh, what it is that God would, would have him to teach his family. He ought to be able to impart teaching to his family and, and, and impart teaching to other people. God expects the man to know. You, you need to know something. Here you are over your household and, and you don't know anything. You, you need to know something. In Psalm 78 and verse number three, uh, the Bible says, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us that there's some things that we just need to be mindful of and aware of we need to know uh the bible says in, in um, ephesians 6 and verse 4 and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and the teaching or the admonition of the lord a, a father is supposed to know there are some things a father is supposed to know he's expected to know god expects him to know certain things some men need to be able um, to see themselves as teachers. Men should be able to teach about life, about experiences they've gone through, about life. They ought to know some stuff. Having traveled through life, you ought to know something. Men need to be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong, truth and error. Hebrews 5 and verse number 12, listen to the Bible. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have neither one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe, but strong meat belonging to them that are full age. Even those who are reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. A man ought to know the difference. And then he ought to be able to correct his children when, when, when he see that they're going down the wrong path. I mean, he ought to see something when, the first sign of disrespect your child displays, you ought to be right on top of it. You ought to be able to deal with things right away and not just let things just stepping back, just see where things are going to go. A man ought to be able to take care of things immediately. He doesn't wait around. He doesn't see what the end is going to be. He takes care of it right then. That's a man. And then and men um, need to have some of the uh, answers to the common questions of life. I say a man, this is uh, something that's incumbent upon a man. And there are certain things he just needs to know. He needs to know. He needs to know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, for, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. He needs to know how life works. He need to understand the, 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 you know, the, the ingredient to life and, and, and what the constant of life is God. And nothing will work without God. Jesus said like this in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. Men need to understand that. Men need to be men. And then I will submit to you that a man needs to be a friend. Not only needs, he needs to be a warrior, he needs to be the head, he needs to be the warrior, he needs to be a teacher, but he also needs to be a friend. Manhood means keeping commitments. He must have the courage, you know, to rebuke when necessary, but he has to learn to be a friend to his wife. Learn, learn to be her friend. And you ought to be her best friend. You, you ought to be her best friend. And, and so many times we, we miss uh, the mark on this. Proverbs 27 and verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We, we, we have to be faithful. We got to learn to be friends. 
You know, keep your commitment. If, which, what you say is what you do. And that's how you draw close to your spouse, through keeping your word, keeping your commitment. And then learn to be a friend. Learn to be a true friend. A, a friend is there at all times, not to criticize, but sometimes you have to just sit there and just listen. Sometimes people just need just a listening ear. They don't need advice. They just need just a listening ear. Can, can you do that? for your spouse? Can you just listen to what it is your spouse has to say? And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful of what our role really, uh, really is. And then, uh, my friend, a man needs to have staying power. A man needs to have staying power. Many men in our culture lack one of the marks of a man. That is patience, steadfastness, endurance, and forbearance. Now, have you noticed how, how, how badly men run in our culture? It's so sad that report came out that one-third of children in America are not living with their natural fathers. Over 15 million, million children are growing up in homes without any father. 70% of men you know, in prison grew up without a father. 70%. It used to be women and children first, but now it become me first. In contrast, godly men... Uh, must learn not to go the way of the world. He must not conform to this world, but rather he must be transformed by the renewing of his mind. He got to stand on his promise. He gave his word. Because you gave your word, your word is your bond. You're going to keep your word. When your marriage is no longer fun, stay in it. When parenting seems like it's over your head, stay in it. When work is crushing your spirit, don't let it beat you. When when the church work is overwhelmed, um, stay, stay there. When it seems like even among Christians, uh, they have given in to overwhelm by pettiness, stay by it. When your children let you down, pick them up. When your wife goes through uh, her mood swings, live with it. Uh, when it's um, 4th and 14 with no, clock on, with no time on the clock, throw another pass. You don't ever, ever give up. Real men, they stay. They stay and they stay. The heart of such staying power is called sacrifice. You, you got to learn to sacrifice. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You have to get to that point. Luke 14 and verse number 26, Luke 14 and verse number 26, listen to the Bible. The Bible says, if any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, or children, brother, and sister, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You got to have staying power. That, the hate, that means to love less. You got to love everybody less than you do the Lord. Luke 9, 23, the Bible says, and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. And follow and follow me is sacrifice. You have to know the power of sacrifice. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing your capacity about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. And do it the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. James tells in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, James said, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this at the trying of your faith work is patience, and let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abrade it not, and it shall be given him. James chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. The Bible says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of our Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brother, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. You see the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Stay in there. Stay in there. Genuine love for God and the people of God 
They need you. Love is patient. Love bears all things. Love endures all things. Before you get married, there are some things you need to talk about before you get married. And I need to uh, just go over this list in, in regards to dealing with premarital questions that need to be asked. And so many times we, we get into marriage and, and then we want to jump back out uh, because many times we fail to ask the right questions before we get in. And there are some things that we need to be mindful of. There are some questions that we really need to um, you need to talk about with your spouse, your potential spouse. Um, you all need to talk. You know, so many times we talk about all these old superficial things, but we need to talk about some some deep things here. And uh, and so I want to uh, deal with some of these things. Uh, and number one, if you're going to get married to somebody, you need to ask yourself and then ask your spouse, why are we getting married? That's the first thing you need to ask. Why, why are we getting married? Number two, uh, what do we as a couple want out of life? Or what do you want out of life? Is what do you want out of life? Number three, do you think our relationship would change after we get married? You talk about it. Y'all get along so well now, but you, do you think things will change after we get married? You want to you ask that question. You know, because um, if they say yes, things are going to change, you want to find out how are they going to change. If things are great now, what can you do to maintain uh, the greatness that you enjoy. Uh, not only that, number uh, four, what do you think uh, we'll be doing, you know, in 30 or 40 years? What do you think down the road, you know, um, 30, 40 years from now? And not only that, break it down five, 10 years from now. What do you think? Break it down. One For one year after our wedding, where are we going to be? Two years after our wedding, where are we going to be? You need to have some goals. You need to have a vision as to where you want to go. What do you think we'll be? You need to talk about that. And, and not only that, but do you drink? You know, do you drink? Be honest, do you drink? How do you feel about drinking? Now that, have you ever been abusive to somebody? Have you ever hit somebody? You know, you want to check out their anger. Do they have an anger problem that they are hiding from you? Now that, do you think it's important to be faithful to one another? You know, how, just how do they feel? You got to make sure you, have a, you can't go by assumptions. You want to get the true answer and get to the heart of matters. Now that, do you have a criminal record? Do you have a criminal record? You want to ask them, what was your childhood like? You know, how were you, how were you raised? And what was your childhood like? And on that, was your family, uh, you know, affectionate to one another? Were they affectionate to each other? You know, now on that, do you think we'll have problems, you know, with your family during the holidays? What are they accustomed to during the holidays? Because what they're accustomed to may not be the same thing you're accustomed to. Now that you're dating, every holiday you may be over to their house. But you say, well, when we get married, I, I want us to have our own tradition. Well, you want to make sure you talk about that. And then on that, but what, what values do you want to bring from your family into our marriage? What values do you, your, your family, is there a closeness? Is there a trust thing? What values do your family uphold? Is there, is, is there a family, you know, togetherness that you want to bring into our marriage? What, what is it? Y'all need to talk. And on that, what, what do you like or dislike about your family? What is it about your own family you don't like? And what is it about your family you do like? Now that, what do you like or dislike about my family? You know, you need to be open and honest. Y'all need to talk about these things. Uh, what do you like or dislike about your parents' marriage? Uh, what do you see that there was a plus or a minus in your parents' marriage? Now, that what do you like or dislike about your parents' marriage? You know, um, about my parents' marriage. You know, in regards to my parents and what you see and ha having been around them, what do you like or dislike about my parents' uh, marriage? And you want to talk about um, how would you describe yourself? You know, because you want to make sure does this person suffer from low self-esteem? You won't know until you ask. And all that, but how do you how do you think I see you? But when I look at you, how do you think I see I see you? And then not only that, but am I a? And do you perceive me as a jealous person? Am I a jealous person? Am I a jealous person? And then all that, you know, do I have uh, trust issues or, or 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 you know, do you feel like I feel insecure? You know, I need you to talk to me because these are issues we need to talk about. If there's insecurity. If there are trust issues, we need to talk about why, why they exist. So you need to learn to talk. Now on that, but how how important is affirmation to me? Affirming that you really love me. You know how do you really do you realize how important that is? You need to talk about that. Right? Do I handle compliments well? Do you feel I handle your compliments well? And then you want to find out what is your love language when you say you love me. What things will you do so I know you know and I'll be able to properly interpret um, what you're doing. Your language of love. And do you think we, we listen to each other uh, well enough? Do you think we listen, listen to each other well enough? Do you think it's important to know one another's physical 
and mental health histories. You know, are there some issues in your health in the past I need to be aware of? Mentally, have you have you had any mental issues? Have you ever spent time in a psych ward? You better find these them any kind of you know a psychological disorders you experienced in the past. You better find out this stuff. Well, you want to find out will you clean the toilet? Will you clean the toilet? You want to find out this kind of stuff. How are we going to divide up the household chores? How are we going to find out the and divide up the household chores? And how do you you want to spend our days off? We take off from work. How do you want to spend those days? And what are your expectations about how we will spend our free time? You know, talk about that. Do you believe that we should um, uh, do everything together? Talk about that because your expectation and what you may be thinking, what they may be thinking, may just be as far as north is from south. You need to talk. You really need to talk. Can we pursue our own interests uh, after we get married? Do you need time alone? Let's talk about that. How would you feel if I want, you know, a night out with my friends every now and then? Well, you need to talk about that. Don't assume that. Uh, how will we make sure we have quality time together? Talk about that. How much time we spend with our in-laws? You need to talk about that. Can we talk about money? That's a very serious issue. You, you need to talk about that. You know, are you are you a saver or are you a spender when it comes down to money? You need to you need to find out about those things. And not only that, but how how much um, do we owe in debt and, and what are our assets? And these are questions that you need. Uh, that you need to talk about it and get the answers uh, to these to these things. Uh, do you want to have a budget? You know, you need to talk about these kind of things. If you have children, do they call you for money? Um, you 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 want to know how y'all going to deal with that? Where does our money go? Where does our money? Where will our money go? You know, we need to talk about that. What are we doing? Should we have a joint um, checking account or a separate account, or should we have both? Well, you're not going to know unless you talk. Who is going to be responsible for making sure that the bills are paid on time? Because both of y'all can't be writing checks. You know, you got to have one person who's going to find who's going to be your finance person. Uh, do you consider going to the movies and having a vacation every year a necessity or a luxury? Well, you'll never know until there's some communication. You need to talk about these things. What are our financial goals? What goals are we going to set for each other? Do we have any outstanding fines or debts that need to be paid before we get married? Are there any parking fines that you have I don't know about? The student loans that you have. I need to I need to know credit card debts. I need to know this stuff before we get married. What are our future plans for purchasing a home? You know, um, do we both know where our important financial documents are located? You need to talk about these things. Do you want to have children? Do, do you want to have the children? And, and not only um, that, do we want to have children? Now, I need to know what you want, and I need to know what we want. And if we decide... Uh, if we decide we do want to have children, how many children do you want to have? How long should we be married before we have children? What kind of parent do you think you think that you will be? You know, what is your parenting philosophy? You find out about that because some that man may feel that the mom is in charge of everything to leave everything up to her. Well, one of us stay home after we have children. What type of birth control should we use if we want to postpone or prevent um, parenthood right away? Well, you, you need to talk about everything. How do you feel about adoption? Do you have any do you have any children already? Does religion play an important part in your family? Do you think faith and spirituality are important in this marriage? What is your uh, image of God? You know, can we talk about sex? Should we talk about sex? Are you comfortable discussing your sexual likes and dislikes? What are your expectations of our sexual relationship? How will we make decisions together? Are we both willing to face um, difficult areas? You know, we, or we try to avoid them. Do you think we have problems in our relationship that need to be um, dealt with before we get married? Um, how do we? How do you think we handle conflict? Do you think we need work to work on that and handling our conflicts that we had since we've been dating? How are we different from each other? And do you think our differences will create problems in our marriage? Um, do uh, Do you expect or do you want me to change? Uh, can we both forgive each other? And are we willing to work on our communication skills and share intimately with one another? Many, many questions I've, I've given you. Uh, my friend, if you uh, need this entire list, you can just uh, call for the CD and we'll uh, gladly send you a free copy. You just listen to Friday's broadcast, jot these things down, and then I begin to discuss um, issues with your potential mate, uh, issues of substance. Listen, my friend, God bless you now in Radio Land. We love you, and that's why we tell you the truth. If you want to be saved, what you have to do, my friend, number one, you got to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
Having heard that, you must believe with all of your heart, repent of all of your sins, confess faith in the fact that Jesus Christ is God's son, and then be baptized in water for sin's remission. Live faithful unto death, and he promised he'll give you a crown of life that won't fade away. My friend, God bless you now. May the Lord keep you, is my prayer. 